Finally, after defining transformations and giving some types and examples in R2 and R3, I want to talk about properties and proof again. This is a new construction and a new algebra, so I want to know how it works. More than that, I want to prove statements about how transformations and matrix multiplication work. Let me start with what I already know from the previous videos. The matrix action is linear. It cooperates with vector addition and scalar multiplication. All linear transformations have a matrix representation. There is an identity matrix in each size that does nothing in composition or equivalently in matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication is associative, but in general, matrix multiplication is not commutative. That's a good start, but what else can I say? Well, one thing I can inve investigate is the behavior of certain subsets of transformations. Here is a proposition. Any two rotations in R2 commute. Let me first offer some in informal motivation. Rotations are all counterclockwise, and a composing two rotations is doing one after the other. If I rotate by a quarter turn and then by a half turn, in total I've done three quarters of a turn of rotation. However, if I do the half turn first and then the quarter turn, surely that's still three quarters of a turn. This is commutativity. Which transformation happens first, the half turn or the quarter turn, shouldn't matter. In this case, intuition says that the angles just add up, so the order shouldn't matter. Well, the intuition is good, but now I need to prove it. How do I prove it? Well, I have the matrix representation of the rotations. I want to prove in general, so I take two general representations, one for an angle theta, and one for an angle phi. I want to prove that AB and BA calculate the same thing. So I need to calculate AB and BA and somehow show that they are the same. This might be a difficult calculation, but it is a direction. The matrix representation, by making a calculation to do, actually allows for this kind of proof in a way that is more formal than the intuitive argument. So let me do the calculation. I first calculate the matrix multiplication of AB. I go across the rows of A and down the columns of B. The first entry will be cos theta times cos phi minus sine theta times sine phi. And similarly, I get the other three entries. Then I can do some trigonometry. These combinations look familiar, at least if I have any memory of my trig identities. These are some identities. The first is exactly the identity for the cosine of a sum of two angles. And the second is the negative of the sine of a sum of two angles, and likewise for the last two entries. And this also made sense. I expected the angles to add up. If I do two rotations by some angle, well then I've just done some rotation by the sum of the two angles. Looks good. But let me try the other order to make sure this lines up. The calculations here are similar, but the phi matrix is first. The result I get, skipping over the details of the calculation, looks very similar. Indeed, if I interchange the multiplications of the terms, which is valid since I'm multiplying numbers here, then I can actually get directly that BA is the same as AB. However, I could also use the trig identities again here and argue that this also is a single rotation of the sum of the two angles. There is something to observe here. I have two different arguments. First, I can just do the two calculations and compare, seeing that after interchanging the order of some of the number multiplications, the two matrices are the same. And that's a fine proof. However, by going further and using the trig identities, I get more information. I see the logic of the proof. Both compositions are still a rotation. The matrix still has the rotation form and the angle is the sum of the two previous angles. The second proof is not more valid, but it is more insightful. And insightful proofs are the best kind of proofs, because they not only prove the result, but give you the idea of why the result works in the first place, what the logic behind it should be. Here is another proposition, another idea about transformations that is intuitive appeal intuitively appealing and that I might want to prove. If you compose any projection with itself, the result is just the same projection. Well, why is that intuitive? Well, 
A projection in R2 is flattening everything down to a line. What happens if you do that twice? Well, after doing it once, everything is flattened down to a line, and if you do it again, all that you have to work with is the line, and flattening it down to itself doesn't accomplish anything. You've already flattened it down to itself. After projecting, projecting again has nothing to do. So it should be true that doing a projection twice is the same thing as doing it once. Let me try and prove it using the matrix representation. Here is the matrix for a general projection, remembering that the vector AB is a unit vector, a vector of length 1. What does that mean? Well, it means the length of the vector, the square root of a squared plus b squared is 1. And if I square both sides of that, it also means that a squared plus b squared equals 1. I said earlier that working with the square of length is often convenient for getting rid of the square root, and that's what I'm doing here. So, I want to prove that the composition of a with itself is the same as a. Doing the projection twice is the same as once. I write this as a squared since this is a product. Whole number exponents make sense to indicate repetition of the transformation. I write the matrix twice and do the matrix multiplication. This is a bit tricky, but let me guide you through the calculation. In the first component, going across the first row and down the first column, I get a squared times a squared plus ab times ab. In the second component, going across the first row and down the second column, I get a squared times ab plus ab times b squared. And I get the second row in a similar fashion. Well, then I have this mess of a matrix. I want to simplify. I look to do some factoring. In the first entry, a squared is a factor of both by taking an a out of both ab terms. Therefore, I can factor a squared out of this. In the second, ab is a factor of both, so I can factor ab out. In the third, ab is again common, so I factor it out. And in the last, by taking b out of each ab term, b squared is a factor of both pieces, so I can factor it out. Then each entry has an a squared plus b squared in it. But a squared plus b squared equals 1, since ab is a unit vector. So replacing all four of these with 1, I get this matrix. But this is exactly the matrix A. Therefore, I've started with A composed with A and calculated to show that I just get A back. Any projection composed with itself, any projection done twice, is the same as the projection done just once. Let me recap. In each of these two proofs, I chose some observation that, observation that I thought should make sense. Rotations should commute, Doing a projection twice should be the same as doing it once. The intuitive arguments, though, are not mathematically conclusive. The matrix representation of the transformation codifies the ideas, gives them a fixed and rigid form. With that form, I can actually prove things about them mathematically, formally. I use the general forms, keeping them general, and argue that for the intuitive ideas via these calculations. And after some clever work, using trig identities, or the fact that a projection has a unit vector to simplify, I can find the result I want and justify my intuition. And this is a very typical pattern of mathematical development. Have an idea about how something works, formalize it into a symbolic and logical system, and use that system to either prove the idea is good, or find out the idea doesn't hold after all, and look for a better one.